Kristen Ashison here, and we're talking about nature, nurture, and human uh, diversity, as your chapter is titled. I personally pr would prefer the name uh, nature plus nurture equal human diversity. We find out that it's not really one or the other, that it really is the combination of the two that really create the diversity that we see amongst our, um, our, rate, our uh, species. So nature and nurture, what does this mean? Nature is that biology, our heredity, our genes are that nature component of it. Where nurture is that environment, the context is the social influences and in the physical worlds around us. And then what we really know um, now is that it's not a debate between nature or nurture and which is more important. And it's a debate that had been going on for quite a, a, a long time, centuries in fact, on which was more important. Um, but what we know is that both really are an integral part of development. And we can't can't look at the development of, um, of anyone, really, without taking both into effect. So how genetically similar do you think um, JT and Beyonce are? Okay, we've got different um, races, we have different genders, we have a lot of different things going on between them. We find that two humans are usually about 99.1% different. So everything that makes these two individuals different and everything that makes you and every other individual in the world different is a, occupying a very, very small part um, of our genetic code. So these genetic foundations, we see that, that humans and chimpanzees actually share 98 to 99% of identical DNA. Um, and we find that individual humans are 99.1% genetically identical. So again, everything that we really think about as differences, um, our differences are a very, very small proportion of our genetic code. Um, really, we have a lot more similarities um, that we do differences. So continuing on this genetic foundations, um, when babies are born um, and when there is um, conception, this can happen in multiple different ways. One of the things we really look at to look at um, this influence of nature and nurture is twins. Um, and so there's a def couple of different ways that we can look at this. Um, the first of which is dizygotic twins. Um, so that is that bottom picture, um, D and E, are dizygotic twins. Um, that's because they had two separate ova, two separate eggs. So we had two separate zygotes. Um, and we'll talk about zygotes and all of that in a bit. But that's just kind of that initial kind of um, con conceived. Once the egg and the sperm merge, we have, um, we have the zygotic phase. Um, and so we have two separate organisms from the beginning. These individuals are going to be the same genetic similarity as um, other siblings would be. Okay, so these are what we call fraternal twins. So dizygotic twins, um, that sounds really fancy, but it's di for two, zygotic for zygot. Um, and really, they have the same genetic similarities as just two siblings. So they just happen to be born at the same time instead of being born a couple of years apart. Where my monozygotic twins, um, mono meaning one, zygote again um, for the organism, ha are co come out of one ova. So A, B, and C pictures in this image um, again are all monozygotic twins. Um, these individuals are genetic clones, okay? Because they're initially coming out of that one egg and sperm combination, that one fertilized egg, um, these are going to be genetic clones. And what we can look at here then is if these people are in fact genetically um, identical, which they are, then any differences between them aren't necessarily going to be due to their genetics, but are going to be due to the environment. And so this allows us, by looking at dizygotic twins versus monozygotic twins, and these twin studies really lets us kind of start to pull apart um, the influence of nature versus the influence of nurture. So again, we're doing this through twin studies, um, is a, a lot of the ways that we're studying nature versus nurture. Um, again, those identical or those monozygotic twins have the same genes, they're genetic clones. Whereas fraternal twins, dizygotic twins, they're no more similar than regular siblings. And we use this research to affect, um, to look at the effects of genes versus behavior, to look at the effect of nature versus nurture. We can also do this with adoption studies. Um, that's another way that we start to look at this. Um, because genetically, um, adopted children have no more similarity to their, their adoptive parents um, than would anyone else in the population. 
And so we can kind of look at this and look at, well, what's the role of environment then, okay? Because these people are not genetically related. Um, what they share is this environment. So we can look at the role of nurture here. We can look at the role of those environmental factors. We see that genes can really influence the environments as well. Um, what we'll talk about a little bit later is kind of that these things are kind of acting out um, on each other. Um, and so we see that genes can really influence the situations that we pick for ourselves, the situations that we encounter, um, and how we handle those situations. And those are changing as well. And we'll continue to talk about this um, in class as well as even more so in Chapter 5. So when we look at these kind of two studies together, what we're looking at is behavioral genetics, okay? We're looking at the role of these two things together. And studies of twins in adulthood show that these identical twins, these monozygotic twins, are more alike than fraternal twins in things such as personality traits and extroversion, um, things like neuroticism. Both of those will indicate that personality traits such as extroversion and neuroticism are, high, are more likely to be genetically related than they are to be environmentally related. Because again, the identical twins will share that genetic code where those fraternal twins will not. So the fact that the identical twins are more similar in these things than the fraternal twins does, again, shows that this is more highly related to the genetic code than it, this behavior is related to the genetic code and not to the environment. We see that that such as behaviors and outcomes such as the rate of divorce are also more similar in identical twins than fraternal twins. And abilities such as overall intelligence scores are also in this. So we see these sorts of things have larger genetic components than some other things. We also found that similarities in identical twins despite being raised apart. So this is when there's two identical twins. Again, they're genetic clones, but they're raised in different environments, okay? So we have the same nature. We have different nurture. And we still are finding that personality styles are going to be very, very similar um, and are going to have this genetic component. Again, IQ having this genetic component. Attitudes, interest, taste, specific fears, brain waves, heart rate, or all these kinds of similarities. And we'll show you a video on epigenetics, which is kind of gives you a funny example um, of, of that as well. Nurture, that environmental influence, um, is kind of everything else. Now, just because these identical twins or these fraternal twins or even siblings were raised in the same environment doesn't mean that everything's the same, right? We can have what's called non-shared environment. So think about, if you have a sibling, think about how you and your sibling were treated differently even though you had the same parents, right? So my mom and dad, my brother and I are six years apart, and my mom and dad, my mom specifically, um, was really, she didn't let us have a lot of sugar growing up, especially um, there was a difference between how me and my brother got kind of sugar growing up. When I was a kid, the kind of um, cereals I got were Cheerios and Rice Krispies. If I was lucky, Kix, um, these really low sugar cereals. By the time my brother came around and by the time my brother was in middle school, he was getting things like Oreo O's, so cereal by the Oreo cookie company. <laughs> so again, we had differences. Um, we also had differences um, in kind of our, you know, our responsibilities towards buying our first car. Um, so I had to pay for my first car outright myself. Um, they tried to do that with my brother. Um, he, they kind of had him pay for it. Um, but as soon as that car broke down relatively quickly, um, they kind of came in and bought him another, bought him a car. So we got had kind of different environments. Some of that was the differences in finances. Um, my dad had started a consulting company when I was in high school that was just kind of getting off the ground. So we didn't have a lot of financial stability when I was in high school. But by the time my brother got into high school, six years later, my dad's consulting business was doing very very well. And so they had a lot more financial stability, a lot more financial flexibility. So while my brother and I, I mean, you look at our baby pictures and it's hard to tell the two of us apart if we're just in diapers, um, are very, very similar genetic. We've got the same parents, we, but we had very different non-shared environments, okay? So we had, and we experienced, this non-shared environment can also be carried out um, and experiencing environments differently. Um, experiencing the same event and having those different interpretations about it. And having different reactions to those situations as well. Creating that different reaction will change that environment as well. 
Again, what we really know from all of this is nature and nurture are working together. Um, I said earlier in the semester that I was going to use the term bidirectional a lot. Here's another chance. Um, development is occurring via bidirectional interactions or co-actions between nature and nurture, between genetics and environment at all levels of the organism. So here's a picture um, from a paper by Gilbert Gottlieb. And what we see here is, again, that genetic activity is affecting neural activity, which is then going back and affecting genetic activity. Same with behavior, same with environment. These are all happening on all the different levels of the organism. And this, this kind of web of development is really what um, changes and creates this diversity in us. That it's the interaction um, between both nature and nurture, between our genetics and our environment, environment that really make us who we are. It's not one, it's not the other, it's the confluence of both of them together. Another um, researcher who uses this model is Broff and Brenner. Um, again, he's saying that this is this bi-directional interaction, that individuals are both products and producers of their environment. So our genes uh, help create those environments for us, okay? So that's how we're producers of our environments. That's kind of how the genes point towards environment. But how the environment ports back towards genes um, is that there's that interplay that goes back, that inner, that uh, environment can change our genes as well. There's a process called epigenetics that I mentioned a few minutes ago, and I'm going to have you watch a video on that. Um, but it really shows us um, that genes can get turned on and off based on these changes in the environment um, that change our genetic code. An example of this bi-directional nature between um, the bi-directional bi relationship between nature and nurture um, is temperament. Um, this is that was something that was studied initially by Thomas and Chess, and then went back and Mary Rothbard kind of has um, kind of revised it to a more modern view. But what we see is that there's several different kinds of temperaments, and that these temperaments are kind of like baby personality or small child personality um, is kind of a kind of a shortcut way to think about it. And that there's different ones, and they're genetically determined, but they help change our environment. And those environments can help change our temperaments as well. So these are categorized into several different things, one of which we have is easy children. Um, easy children are those ones that establish regular routines. They're cheerful. They adapt easily to new experiences. This is kind of the kid that everybody hopes for. Um, and again, they really are kind of go with the flow kind of kids, okay? They're adaptable. Um, they establish a routine. If bedtime's at seven o'clock, they go to bed at seven o'clock really, really well. Um, they adapt to new changes. They adapt to new experiences. You can take them a new place and they're not gonna freak out. Um, whereas difficult children, have these more um, irregular, they're, they are more irregular in their daily routines, okay? They, um, some mornings will wake up at seven, some mornings are gonna wake up um, at five, some mornings are gonna wake up at nine. They are irregular in their routine, okay? When they take them someplace new, um, it's hard to accept that new experience and their reactions tend to be very negative and very intense, okay? So this is where you take a kid someplace new and they flip out. OK, um, this these children can be at risk for adjustment problems. We also have the third group of, of individuals, the third group of children, the slow to warm up children. These kids are more inactive. Um, they have mild, low key reactions to stimuli and they still they're still adjusting slowly to um, new experiences. When they started this kind of categorization of the three, what they found, though, was 35 percent did not fit into one of these kind of categories um, that we really were seeing unique blends of these as well. We do see that these temperamental um, differences have some kind of stability. I mean, they're again biologi biologically based, but they're typically persistent over time. So we see that these emotionally reactive infants um, continue to be emotionally reactive at nine months. So they may be taking, testing them really early on at about two months, and still seven months later, they're still emotionally reactive children. We see shy six-month-olds are still shy at 13 years of age. And again, this is not everybody. Remember that we are a science, like all science, of science of averages. Um, and so on average, um, a shy six-month-old um, may develop into a shy 13-year-old. Emotionally intense preschoolers 
tend to kind of maintain that level of intensity as young adults. Okay, so again, that there is just, this is how that individual reacts emotionally to these situations, and that's kind of a persistent reaction. We also see that identical twins, more than fraternal twins, have similar temperaments. Again, this is going to point towards um, this really genetic, this biological base of temperament. Um, because again, these identical twins are genetic clones, where our fraternal twins are no more similar than siblings. And we see more similarities in temperament with the genetic twin, the genetic clones, than we do with typical siblings and fraternal twins. So again, this points towards that biological base. There's a video that I hope to show you in class that again will show you kind of this relationship um, kind of between um, nature and nurture here as when using temperament as an example. We also see that the environment affects the temperament as well, okay, or the nurture. We see differences in how cultural beliefs and practices, um, kind of how these children are distinguished between them. We see that Asian mothers tend to do more comforting and Caucasian mothers tend to be more st stimulating. And these, again, are averages. Um, and this is some older literature, and um, so it may not be as current kind of findings. But at the time, Asian mothers were doing more comforting and Caucasian mothers were doing more stimulating. And what they found was Asian infants tended to be less active, less irritable, and vocal than Caucasian infants. The Caucasian infants were getting this more uh, kind of stimulating env environment, so they were more active, they were more irritable, and they were more vocal, um, so that these environments um, kind of changed their behaviors. We also see differences in gender. Um, parents encourage their sons to be physically active and their daughters to seek help and physical close, closeness. Um, this kind of changes the environment. It changes how you emotionally respond to something. Um, boys are encouraged to use that kind of emotional response in a physical way, where girls are encouraged to use that emotional um, way um, to seek help and physical closeness. Those are very, very different kinds of ways to deal with emotions. Um, and so again, we'll see differences on gender um, based on parental encouragement of how to express those emo emotions. Within families, um, we see that when one child is viewed as easy, the other one may be perceived as difficult. Even if you kind of have, even if you were to measure them both and both of them came up easy temperament, um, if you had one kid that is perceived as easier, the other one's going to be perceived as difficult. Again, that's not compared to children in general, but compared to each other. Um, so why do you always have to be so difficult? Your brother doesn't do that. Um, those sorts of kinds of things. That changes the environment for both of those children. One of them, child labels themselves as the, you know, the, the good, easy kid, the well-behaved kid that doesn't cause trouble, and the other one labels themselves as the one that's kind of always has something going on. Um, and again, this creates different environments for these two individuals. Finally, we can have these kind of cultural differences in our nurture. Um, we see that kind of more westernized cultures, um, we see that the values that they hold for themselves, and, and the United States is considered a westernized culture, are very different than what we see from some Asian and African cultures, or sometimes what are referred to as the more Eastern cultures. We've kind of revised these terminology, and we have individualistic cultures. Again, the United States is an individualistic culture versus a collectivist culture, um, which the Asian African African cultures, those Eastern cultures tend to be more collectivist. And again, there's a difference between them. So in an individualized culture, you're responsible for yourself. Okay, and you hear that again, especially right now in the in the political arena, right? Everybody's kind of saying you're responsible for yourself. That's kind of the narrative that we say. Um, I was just thinking that today with my daughter's um, library book. It's late again, um, and I was thinking to myself, she needs to be responsible for this. This is not my responsibility. This is her responsibility. That's very indicative of that individualistic culture that we live in. Whereas these other cultures, these collectivist cultures, tend to be more responsible to a group. So they have this kind of group mentality, um, and we all, what's good for the common group? Not what's good for me, what's good for everybody? Um, we see these individualistic cultures tend to be more follow your conscience, where the um, collectivist cultures are more have a priority on obedience. We see individualized cultures, really it's about discovering your gifts, where we see these these collectivist cultures really are about not 
who you want to be, but true to the who the family is, okay? And there's those differences. And again, that's the same difference with the be true to yourself versus the be loyal to your group. Um, the be independent versus be inter interdependent, interdependent on each other. Again, these are these frameworks that kind of change kind of the outlooks that we see, our priorities, and what we see is important um, in ourselves and what we see is important in others. So this kind of gives you a taste of some of these nature versus nurture things. Um, we'll continue to talk about this on class and see you there on Tuesday.